introduced. My name is Jay Ren. I'm Associate Principal Scientist at Merck, a pharmaceutical company. Um, within Merck, I work to bring in digital technologies and data science capabilities to aid clinical development. And with that said, I do have a physics PhD, and I'm currently leading the topical group on data science within American Physical Society. Um, so we're really, really happy to bring this session to you uh, on behalf of GDS uh, and, and happy that you can join us in today's session. So uh, just a little bit uh, of background about APS GDS. Um, this unit within APS is formed in early 2019 with the hope to connect all physicists who are involved in the data science world. So um, hopefully we will be able to share knowledge and experience, bring in training and career pr prospects, as well as advance research topics at the intersection of physics and data science. We have been very fast growing and have um, started some really successful programs within GDS. Um, but we are also uh, hoping that if you can also join us if you're interested. Um, and uh, our bigger hope is to connect and advocate for physicists in the data science world. Uh, community building is the primary goal uh, of GDS in our session here as well. So we really welcome your participation in this uh, broader discussion. Uh, within this session and also afterwards, we'd love to uh, we'd love you to be friends with us. Um, and we strive as we strive to offer you interesting contents and valuable insights about physics and data science. Uh, please feel free to, you, you will be able to find us on the APS website or LinkedIn, Twitter, and anything. Just search APS data science. Um, and with that, I will now introduce our first speaker, William Radcliffe, who will speak to AI and ML in the domain of physics research today. Um, just a little bit of background, William is an APS fellow and has made exceptional contributions to neutron scattering studies of the magnetic order and spin dynamics in multiferroic materials. William is an early adopter of data science techniques and have been employing AI and ML in his research work. He also sits on the executive committee of APS topical group on data science. So with that, I hand it over to you, William. Hello, everyone. Um, so thank you so much for joining us on a um, Friday evening to talk a little bit about the intersection of physics and AI. Um, so I was thinking a little bit about how to do this in that generally when you're chatting or you're on a panel, it's always great to know your audience. But here, I think our audience is twofold. Mainly, I think that some of you are machine learning practitioners who are curious about um, what we're doing in physics. And then maybe there are some physicists who are also looking to see um, what they can do with um, AI. And so I'll talk a little bit broadly about some of the trends that um, I've observed recently. But I want to leave time open for question and answer uh, because I think that that's where we get the true value add from uh, panels. So, um, right. So one area that has been um, very productive and very fruitful has been applying um, the new techniques of deep learning to uh, problems related to pattern recognition in physics and to images in particular. Um, so um, when I think of imaging, I begin to think back to my misspent youth uh, where I was very interested in astronomy. And one of the things that astronomers are often doing is trying to figure out from their images what exactly they're seeing. You know, like, am I seeing a galaxy? If I'm seeing a galaxy, what type of galaxy am I seeing? And with large surveys of the sky, the amount of data that's coming in is, is unimaginable. And so you have to um, automate this process. And in their case, they have an, well, I should be nice, but they have a very old file format called FIT, where its resolution is much um, different than what you would find in the standard training sets of uh, ImageNet. And so recently, a group of astronomers actually decided to train their own neural network to classify different types of galaxies. And so one of the things that they um, did is they made their own variant of UNet where um, they were able to tell, okay, is this a um, spiral galaxy, for example, or other type of galaxy, or 
the part that is very challenging. Is this just the background or is this even something that we just don't know what it is? And um, that would be an example of pattern recognition um, being applied in the physics domain, where it's not so much that you're greatly extending deep learning, it's more that you're applying it to your particular um, problem and speeding up a task that becomes uh, not humanly doable. Um, the other thing, um, another aspect that people have done is that they've applied um, modern methods of AI to see whether or not they can spe uh, speed up calculations. And Trevor may speak a little bit more about this, um, though I believe he's focusing on education methods. But um, when we are studying materials, there are types of calculations known as density functional theory calculations, where the cost for doing these is incredibly high in order to simulate the properties of materials. And what we want to be able to do is um, try to see if we can search for materials with interesting properties um, in silico before actually trying to grow them in lab. During my PhD, I synthesized a lot of materials. It's hard work. And if you're in industry, um, this, these can also be very costly where you're working with things like indium or iridium or what have you. And so can you look even before you make something and guess at what its properties will be? And for these calculations, even if you make approximations um, so that you don't actually have to calculate what's going on with 10 to the 23rd atoms, then they're still uh, rather expensive and often run on supercomputers. And so one thing that people have been doing is trying to train pieces of these models uh, sorry, train neural networks to look at some pieces of these models to see if the trained neural network can do calculations faster than what you might find um, with just doing the direct calculation. Um, so that's been an interesting area of research. And there people have worked on different philosophical schools of trying to say, should we try to encode the symmetries that we understand must be in a material? Or should we try to discover this from the sets of data that we actually have. And this is something that we might talk about later, but one of the problems that we often have when we're working with materials is that um, the existing set of data is relatively small, especially for inorganic systems where we only have maybe a couple hundred thousand materials where we actually have um, even just their crystal structures. And of those, we, we definitely don't have all of their other interesting um, properties. And so that's, that's a challenge. Um, um, and then I'd say that one of our other broad areas of um, applications of AI to, um, to research is in the area of autonomous control, which is, you know, can I, for example, um, in my own research, apply reinforcement learning to try to see whether or not I can control some instrumentation to do some measurements. And can I find a way um, to do this automation faster than what is traditionally done, where often people will do grid searches, which are rather inefficient. Um, but um, using reinforcement learning, we can cut this down by at least an order of magnitude in terms of the, the time required to do these measurements. Um, and in other cases, maybe you aren't using reinforcement learning, but maybe if it's um, a small enough dimensional problem, people are applying Gaussian processes, um, or in some cases, uh, Monte Carlo tree search. So um, I'd say that these are some of our, our general broad areas at the moment, either things involved with pattern recognition, things involved with accelerating modeling, things involved with automating processes. And then the hope with all of this is to see whether or not we can apply some of this to actually learning new physics. And we've had a handful of talks. Um, you can find one on our YouTube channel. Um, if I'm fast during um, maybe the next panel, I can link to it. But um, cases where people are applying things like graph neural networks to test various uh, models in um, statistical mechanics. So um, I think I'll leave off from there. I think that this gives you a flavor of some of what's going on in physics and AI. And uh, please ask questions in the chat. And I think that that's where we'll get the real value add. All right, thank you.
That is terrific. Thank you so much, William. Um, we are open and I am uh, monitoring the chat screen. So if uh, anyone has questions, please feel free to just throw it into the chat screen. We will make sure to address it. Um, so I hope that um, gives everyone a flavor of what we are trying to do with machine learning and AI uh, in the physics world, in, in terms of physics research. Um, then uh, with that, I hope also to move on to our second topic, uh, which will be um, conveyed by Trevor David Rohn um, on the education aspect, uh, data science education aspects for physicists. So uh, with that, let me give a little bit of background introduction of Trevor. Um, Trevor David leads a research group at the intersection of material science and artificial intelligence and teaches data science to physicists. He received a liberal arts education from McAllister College in St. Paul and also obtained PhD in physics from Columbia University. Trevor David spent several years at NTT Basic Research Laboratories in Japan and during a research stint at the uh, National Institute of Material Science in Japan, he transitioned to material informatics research. And uh, with that, he exploited machine learning tools to perform materials research. He continued this work at Harvard University, uh, where he used machine learning tools to search for new 2D magnetic materials. And also, most recently, he um, is a professor at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, um, uh, also following uh, the same passion of machine learning and material research. And with that, um, I will hand it over to you, Trevor. Thank you so much. Thank you for the nice introduction, Jane. I will sh start my presentation. Please let me know if you can you can see the correct uh, mode. It's perfect, Trevor. Excellent. Great. Thank you. So the title of this talk is Data Science Education for Physicists. And this will be a talk essentially getting physicists who might be interested in studying data science some path towards doing so. The reason I think this is important is when I first started, I had no idea what to do or where to start. And I sort of figured it out along the way, but I wish I had some sort of guide to, to help me. So hopefully this serves as a useful guide for you. Now, I like, I like starting these introductory talks with this um, poem by Rudyard Kipling. It's, uh, I keep six honest serving men. They taught me all I knew. Their names are what and why and when and how and where and who. So let's begin our discussion by talking about what is data science. Data science is a very highly disciplinary area of research. It involves digital data, statistics, computer science, combined with some sort of knowledge base. And this can be anything you like, chemistry, astrophysics, image recognition, and anything that you're interested in. Another way of saying this, that it combines different fields. It's at the intersection of statistics, visualization, and databases, data mining, and also intersects with machine learning and a broader subset of uh, something called AI, okay, or artificial intelligence. Now, why do we care about data science? Well, there, there are a few things we can, we can say about this. Perhaps the first is that what's the most pervasive area in our lives is for targeted advertising. Companies like Facebook, they, um, they use a lot of data science. They care about that, Amazon, and Google, and so on. Uh, these days, we watch a lot of movies at home on Netflix, and Netflix uses data science to help us make movie recommendations. And also, um, in the past, last recent years, the self driving cars has become something important in our lives that embraces artificial intelligence and data science. Now, more recently, maybe four or five years now, um, the application for data science in materials discovery, uh, physics research, condensed matter physics research has really exploded. And one of the reasons people are interested in doing this is because experiments and uh, first principles for phys physics calculations are slow. And expensive. And there's also a really cutting edge interest in using these these new tools to uncover new physical insights. Can we learn some physics from using these tools that are 
more challenging, more challenging to uncover without using these data-driven tools. <clears throat> now let's look into uh, the when and the where of data science. And let's go back many, many, many years ago to Thales de Miletus in ancient Greece. Uh, the first recorded incidents of someone using data science or, or data scientist was uh, the record of Thales de Miletus around 600 BC. Uh, since then, fast forward for many, many years, it's common, uh, commonly used in social media and targeted advertising, as I mentioned before. And uh, as William mentioned in, in observational astronomy, and, and all their areas such as bioinformatics, and more recently materials informatics. And really today is the age of, of big data. We've arrived at the age of big data where data are accessible and data analytics tools are also really accessible. And this really powers the, um, the age of big data, these, these two things. So let's transition to how to do data science. And I'll give you the essential guide for getting started. First, you have to get some data. Then you have to ask yourself, what are the good descriptors of, of these data? And then perhaps you do some plots to get a sense of how the data behave. Then you pick a model, then you check the model. And then once you've built a nice model, you can exploit it as, as, as much as you like. This is the model exploitation stage. Now let's take an example. Let's say you have uh, uh, houses. These are houses in Copenhagen and you get some data with their, with their prices. So you get some labels for the house. The label is the price in this case. So these are labeled data and you choose a good descriptor. So maybe you choose the number of windows, try to estimate the price of the house and not the color of the home, for instance. And then you kind of continue along these, along these lines to try to estimate the housing price. Okay. Now, the, these tools exist in a really nice data science ecosystem that make combining data and descriptors and models really, really uh, streamlined. So there are tools like MongoDB, which store data. You can transform your data into any way you like using uh, tools like Python, which are free and, and powerful. And then you can import Python packages like sklearn, scikit-learn to build models to predict things that you'd like to, to know about. And then once you build these nice models and you have some nice results, you can use matplotlib to visualize all the very nice results um, that you, um, you want to visualize. So data science, as I said, is a combination of material science, of, of or rather data visualization and machine learning. And the goal is to approximate some function f of x which, exp which tries to describe something about the nature, some underlying behavior or phenomena you try to capture with some function f of x. And the thing you measure or calculate is its target property is, um, has some noise associated with epsilon, is the noise. So the interesting about, about this function f of x is that it takes many inputs. So, so far we talked about the color of the home and the uh, number of windows of the home, but uh, you could also uh, include some n-dimensional uh, inputs where n is growing large. And the advantage of data science or machine learning approach is that you can look recognize patterns in high dimensional data where a human can typically look at maybe two or three dimensions, maybe four max. It's hard to look at hundred parameter space and identify patterns in these data. And a machine has no problem with doing that. So the goal is to learn or quantify some relationship with these, with these tools. Okay. Now let's look at an example of how to identify a good descriptor with data visualization. And let's jump back to the idea of uh, housing prices. So I'm plotting here constructed area on the horizontal axis with home price on the vertical axis and I'm plotting um, different houses. So each point represents a home and its, and its price. And I noticed that these data appear to be correlated. So perhaps the constructed area is a good descriptor for a housing price. So this visualization is, has helped us to realize that, that key behavior, key relationship between housing price and constructed area. I, I, I can repeat this process for different descriptors to try to find ones that are better or as good as constructed area. Now, broadly speaking, there are two kinds of machine learning. There is a supervised learning broadly and roughly, and uh, there's supervised learning and unsupervised learning. And supervised learning are, are basically building models where you know the label. Um, so, so for instance, let's say you try to predict having some data whether your house has a view, a good view or not. And if it does have a good view, it's uh, these um, blue circles. If it doesn't have a good view, then it, these, uh, it's these um, red X's. 
Now, if you have a new home that you really don't know has a good view or not, you like to be able to, um, you have an unlabeled data point. You like to be able to figure out where it falls in this space. Let's say it falls uh, on the left of this line, then you know right away this must be a point that has a, a house that has a good view. If it falls to the right of this line, it must be a house that doesn't have a good view. Okay, so you can use machine learning via supervised learning to do classification. There's also an unsupervised learning approach, which is really powerful. Now, your data, they don't have labels, but something interesting happens. You might notice that these data points, they, they all clustered in different parts of the space. So um, if you look carefully and maybe examine these points more closely, you might find that there's a common, common characteristic between all three of them, that they have the same color. So it helps you to, to learn more about the data from a kind of high level data driven perspective. Some examples of statistical models that are used in machine learning. Here is the MX plus C, the linear model that you know and love. That's one example to do regression. One that's perhaps a bit less familiar is this, these models based on decision trees, some of which are called random forests, but it's based on this decision tree. This is a silly example uh, of a decision tree. In this case, we're trying to predict a credit card, whether to give somebody a credit card or not. And there are three descriptors. There's age, student status, and uh, credit card score. And you traverse the descriptor to make a prediction by asking first, what is the person's age? And if they're young, you ask, uh, are you a student? And if they're not a student, you don't give them the credit card. And if they are a student, then you, you give them the credit card. So this is a silly, silly example for classification. And you can also use a scheme to do regression as well. Okay, so let's look at an example of regression more, more closely, but with a more familiar tool like MX plus C, the linear model. So you have some data right here these blue uh, circles, and they look a little bit linear. So you choose an MX plus C, a linear model to try to predict the next point that could occur in the data set. And the machine learning involves learning M, the slope, and C, the intercept. And then once you've predicted, um, have your model, you can, you can make as many predictions as you like, evaluating this function f of x with some given x. Now let's say each point took you uh, six months to, to get, to calculate or to, to measure. Having a way of evaluating many more points is very, very useful very quickly. Okay, so that's one of the, the nice things about building models. Now it so happens if you look at test data, each of the model hasn't seen before, these red squares, if you compare it to the, the model, you find that, uh, well, actually in this case, the model is performing quite, quite well. So you're happy with the model. You can also do classification. This is an example of classification. And this particular example is more physics-y. And so it, it uh, speaks to predicting ferromagnetism in transition metal alloys, and then plotting on the horizontal axis available atomic volume, and on the vertical axis, the calculated chemical hardness, which is like d mu dn, when used chemical potential and these number of electrons. And I'm, I'm, I've labeled data here now, so I have the, the closed squares as non magnetic compounds, and the open squares as ferromagnetic compounds. And if you look closely, they're all the Ferrobacterins kind of cluster in some region of this two-dimensional chemical space, okay? Two dimensions because it has two axes, um, horizontal and vertical axis. And so if you have some new point, you don't know it's magnetic order, but each point takes you like a month to measure, say, then you want to save a month of your time by using this kind of plot. And you might have guessed that this point, even though it's not labeled, it should be non-magnetic because it's a non-magnetic region. And this point, because it's in the ferromagnetic region, it's likely to be a ferromagnet. But this is the essence of machine learning. We can make this more quantitative by using this decision tree model. And in this particular example, there are two chemical descriptors. There's a, a which use descriptors. There's the chemical hardness uh, here, and there's atomic volume here. And by traversing the tree in this way, you can predict whether it's a non-magnetic or ferromagnetic. Okay. Um, a key uh, point in building models is this idea of overfitting. So there are three plots here each showing the same data, okay? But on the, on the left, there is a model, a model that has high bias or underfit, this is a linear model. It doesn't capture the underlying behavior of the data. Over on the far right, there's a model that perfectly predicts the data. You can kind of tell it's not a very good model because it, it doesn't uh, really capture the trend. And the, in, in between, there's a model that's just right, that captures the trend of the model without fitting to the, the error in the, um, in the measurement. And machine learning typically tries to reach this, this uh, just right um, point by playing some uh, tricks um, with uh, the analysis. Okay. 
Now, uh, a model that really deserves its own few slides is neural networks because it's really popular. And it's loosely this, uh, uh, these nodes comprising of input layers, hidden layers, and output layers, where mathematically they're related in this way. And the key to the, to the neural, networker, neural network is that the uh, inputs are mapped to hidden, hidden nodes and eventually to the outputs through this activation function. Let's look at a particular example. So again, we're, we're going back to housing prices and we have inputs, the size of the home and the bedroom and so on. And if you walk through this math, inputs walking to the prediction here, mapping to the prediction here, it gets passed through the sigmoid and the sigmoid serves the role of a nonlinear activation function. It allows neural network to learn nonlinear behavior. Otherwise it would just be a, a big uh, linear network. Now there are many different kinds of neural network architectures. We've already seen the perceptron, the previous slide, and the feed for neural network in the slide before that. But the many different architectures each serve a different purpose. So one has to choose the architecture according to what they want to do. Now let's quickly look at a case study and apply to my um, area of research. Where we're looking at magnetic 2D crystals. This was discovered in 2017 and first to 2D magnets. Now it has some scientific interest and it's uh, chromium germanium telluride, which is ferromagnetic. And it comprises of A, B, and X sites. This is a crystal structure. Turns out chromium silicon telluride is anti ferromagnetic. And by changing the crystal structure, you change the magnetic properties. So there's some relationship that maps crystal structure with magnetic properties. So we can change these A, B, and X sites uh, ad nauseum and we get 10 to the four possible um, structures. Let's take a few of those and notice that there's a pattern in the data where the color represents the magnetic moment. And I, I, I want to learn this pattern using the machine learning model to make quantitative predictions. So I do that in the next slide and I prepare, I compare my machine learning magnetic moment with my predicted magnetic moment. And I get a nice prediction. This, this dashed line represents the perfect prediction line and it's looking pretty good. And for details, uh, please see my, um, my, my recent published paper here. And once we have a nice model built, we can explore the entire space of, of compounds, which in this case is 10 to the four. I spent 200, um, six months trying to calculate 200 compounds. I didn't want to try to calculate 10 to the four compounds. So I used my model to do that. And in the end, I got some predictions, which I show just a subset of those. So who can do data science? Moving on to the, the who in our um, when, where, and who um, model. So typically it's a space that belongs to data wranglers, computer scientists, statisticians, and as you might guess, um, physicists. And here are a few famous physicists whose fields use um, data science. And perhaps one day you'll be using data science too in your old field, in your own field of, of research. This is supposed to be you, um, by the way. So resources for continuing after the discussion are here. I'll point out a few. There's Coursera, that's how I got started. There's uh, workshops like IPAM at UCLA. There's materials products for data. And there's data science tools like Scikit-Learn and um, TensorFlow and so on. And for more information, feel free to visit my, my homepage where you can see these resources, um, what I presented here and more. Thank you so much for your attention. All right, that is wonderful. Thank you so much, Trevor. Um, so now we have um, already had two topics um, discussed about, right, the, uh, data science application in physics research and also data science education um, among physicists. So uh, with that, I will now turn to our last speaker, um, Jennifer Hobbs, who can talk about path into industry in transferring your skill sets in data science. Um, so she is uh, an accomplished um, person uh, in the industrial setting. Uh, also similar uh, to uh, my background, she also has a physics PhD. So uh, Jennifer will talk to us about entering uh, AI field from physics. So a little bit of introduction. Uh, Jennifer is currently the director of machine learning at Intel and Air, which is an agricultural 
Electro Tech startup using computer vision and machine learning to deliver intelligence and insights for agriculture. Through her diverse industry experience, Jennifer has been involved in all phases of the data science life cycle, transforming raw data into compelling technology products through data modeling and architecture and data pipeline design and management, machine learning and visualization. So that is quite a wide ranging skill set that Jennifer has uh, in the AI and ML world. She completed her PhD in physics and astronomy at Northwestern University with a focus on computational and statistical neuroscience. And with that, I will hand it over to you, Jennifer. Terrific, well, welcome everybody. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of an idea, you know, of different career opportunities and how, you know, if you're in physics or coming from a physics program, what that might look like. Um, and I'll kind of start by going through some of my background, just if, uh, if anything, it kind of to show that, um, you know, I think at some point early on, we, we think that we know exactly where we're headed in our career. Um, and particularly if you go down the PhD uh, route, you probably have, um, you know, some kind of idea of what it was going to look like on the other side. Um, but, uh, as you'll see, a lot of things are kind of ever changing and I would encourage you to just kind of be open to some of those opportunities as, uh, as you kind of move along, uh, through your career development. So, um, my undergrad I did also at Northwestern, I was in, uh, the integrated science program and also majored in math and physics. And so I started out doing research, uh, in high energy physics, well, actually on the Minerva project, um, with studying neutrinos out at Fermilab and was involved in, um, the, uh, construction of the detector out there and, and absolutely loved doing it. And then, you know, continued to do my PhD uh, in the same uh, project at Northwestern. And as we started to do more physics, I realized that my interest was really kind of less on the physics and more of, the, of I had really enjoyed kind of the engineering component uh, of, the, of the, the high energy life cycle, if you will. And so um, at that point, I switched my research focus into computational and statistical neuroscience um, and was looking at how touch uh, is encoded by the, by the brain. And while originally my work was, was kind of a combination of computational and behavioral, as my PhD progressed, it became kind of more and more um, focused on the computational element where, where my interests were. And the way I got involved in doing kind of machine learning at all was that there was another student in the lab who needed some work, needed some help, kind of doing the analysis for his project and he was going to use some kind of basic machine learning and you know, in this case, just some GLMs to do a uh, spike prediction. And my, and my advisor said, well, you're a physicist, you're good at work or you're good at math, um, see if you can help him out. And so that's how I got, I kind of got involved. I got in, exposed to, to the GLMs and went, well, this is really interesting. I like this. I went about um, you know, looking into machine learning more broadly um, still, even in my research, didn't use a ton of it, at least not some of the more you know, sophisticated techniques that people are aware of now, um, but it's really kind of what uh, inspired my interest. And then um, I had always intended on staying in academia. Um, I loved teaching. I loved being involved in the academic uh, landscape, but there was a lot of uncertainty there, and I wasn't necessarily sure I was willing to kind of keep going down that route. Um, with a question mark kind of, you know, there years out down the road. And so when I decided to enter industry, um, at this point, the big data science boom had not yet happened. So people were starting to, the buzzword at the time was probably either maybe analytics or big data. So people were starting to think about using data to solve and answer business type problems. Um, but at that point, it was still very much oh, I have some data across these different databases. I need to pull them together and I need to, you know, build, um, you know, again, a decision tree, GLM against this data and, and use that to, um, you know, make a better, make a better prediction. And, and so the focus there was really more on the, the data side. So while I was still, you know, as, as I decided to transition while I was still in graduate school, um, starting to try to teach myself something like pig or hive, which were the kind of popular languages right then, um, you know, to, to become comfortable to make that switch. And so when I, my first uh, job out of my PhD was at a commercial insurance company um, and worked on a variety of projects there, which I really in, enjoyed. And so that was what we would probably consider today like a true data science position. So again, using data from a variety of sources, mostly structured, but some unstructured 
to, in this case, you know, build, you know, the models for either claims or pricing, you know, or something like that. Um, and I really enjoyed what I was doing. But then after being there for a while, there was a, an opportunity to go to a sports technology company, which was something that I had had interested in since, um, since I was young. I was very interested in, in multi-agent motion. Um, and this had the opportunity to be more of a tech focused job. And so I, I took, the, took the jump and switched over there and I was there for several years. And there we were using um, a variety of machine learning models, eventually getting into some of the deep learning models to do uh, computer vision, as well as again, uh, action recognition, you know, motion forecasting, as well as maybe more of your kind of sports statistics type, um, you know, analytics that, that you might think of. And, uh, and then uh, about, about a year ago now, um, joined uh, Intellinaire, which is an ag tech startup doing um, computer vision, as well as um, other forms of machine learning to, uh, you know, find things from, from imagery and, and other sources of data to alert farmers about uh, things going on in their field. Like uh, there's weeds over here, you need to take action. Um, the ground is not too wet to plant, go ahead and, and start putting down your seed and things like that. So. Um, I, as you can see, it took a very uh, kind of circuitous route to get where, where I'm at. And so like, how does that all kind of tie back to, to physics? What did, I, what did I gain from my physics education? Um, and I think there's a couple of things. Obviously, the first thing that kind of, um, regardless of where you need to go, is um, our coding skills. Um, depending on the program you're in, um, often there is not a kind of strict formal uh, coding component to a, particularly to an undergrad program, where I learned to code was through, um, through the research that I did. And so if, um, if you're in a program that, that doesn't require, um, doesn't require coding, but you know, are thinking about going into data science, I'd highly recommend, um, whether it's an independent study project, whether it's research, what, you know, whatever you, whether it's taking a formal course, there's a lot of um, resources out there and I would just encourage you to kind of um, develop that muscle because that's very, um, very important. As I mentioned, when, when I was in graduate school, kind of the, um, the, you know, the, the tool of the day were, you know, were things like pig, hive, and then shortly thereafter, spark. Um, spark has really kind of come to dominate that field. So a lot of times people ask, What's, what should I learn? What's language I should learn? What tool should I learn? And um, you know, for, for data science, I, I recommend Python. Some people will, will, will lean more toward R, particularly if they're on more of the analyst side. Um, but the main thing is the ability and the comfort to pick up whatever tool um, is coming next. Because particularly in this field, the speed at which new tools, new technologies come out is just, uh, is so fast. And really when, when I, now in a hiring role, when I look to, to hire somebody, it's really their ability to say, hey, I need you to learn how to do this. Can you go out and pick up that skill set? And that's um, that's really really the key because a, a new tool will come along in six months, and and somebody who's able to learn that quickly is more valuable than somebody who knows how to code in a specific language um, today. Um, the other thing I think that being in physics helped me with is just um, a certain viewpoint, particularly as we get as as a lot of these deep learning models have become more popular. There's just a certain intuition that I think you gain um, being in a physics program, the way we think um, about measurement, about uncertainty, um, about energy functions that just naturally carry over. There's a lot of, obviously a lot of statistical mechanics that are present in the statistics of, uh, of, these, of the approaches. And so I think there's just a, a really strong kind of formalism as well as intuition that you gain out of a physics program um, there. And then the other thing that I think the physics programs give you is the um, is really again the ability to systematically explore to you know I have a problem I want to solve I need to convert kind of this this conceptual problem into a mathematical or scientific problem that I can go about and solve with these methods conduct that experiment analyze the results and then report back so really I think that kind of scientific rigor really benefits uh, benefits you regardless of kind of what role you you um, go into. And then on that, I'd say a lot of people who say, again, I, I want to go into, I'm in physics, I want to go into data science. Um, I'd encourage them to kind of pause and say, well, what, what is it exactly that you're interested in? Because data science has become a sort of um, catch-all phrase um, that, as you've kind of seen from, from our previous panelists, spans a lot of different things. And particularly in industry, um, you can have 
a variety of different roles that um, particularly as you advance in your career start to uh, go down different paths. So on one side, you have somebody who's more in like a traditional, um, let's call it like a business analyst type of role. Again, they might be, might be using Python, but they're probably using R, they're using business analytics tools like Tableau. And really the idea there is that I need to understand the business and the data side and basically use data to drive business intelligence, um, business decisions, maybe marketing, things like that. Um, then you'll have you know, maybe maybe a little bit, if you want to even split them into like a, what I would call that data scientist role, who's possibly using like a, or sometimes we'll refer to as a full stack data scientist, somebody who's doing that analysis, but is also using um, tools like Spark to bring in data, build models, deploy them um, so that you can answer maybe more sophisticated questions, possibly building them into a pipeline that might support something like um, uh, recommendation engines for, for a company. And then kind of keeping moving even more, more heavily into kind of let's call it the straight tech area. Then you start to have people who are kind of into the uh, machine learning applied research and then the machine learning engineers. So like a machine learning engineer is going to be more geared towards the one who they could be doing some data engineering and building pipelines, but also almost exclusively focused on um, the model deployment, maybe some tuning, maybe developing the infrastructure around which all of the models are going to be um, integrated with. And then, um, then there are some like applied research roles out there, which is more of what, what my team does currently, which is building, um, building models that are sitting, that are, uh, I'm gonna say more, more tech focused than some of the, let's call them data science models out there. So like using computer vision to, um, you know, again, in our case, detect patterns across the field. So a lot of it is, you know, when they, when somebody says, I want to go into data science, um, it's finding out what you're, what you're interested in. Do you like doing the engineering? Do you really like telling the story with the data on the business side? Um, are you really trying to sit closer to maybe some of more of the, the applied research and trying some of those techniques? Um, so, you know, exactly what skill set you're looking for will largely uh, be dictated by which kind of role you're, you're um, going to to slot into. Um, so that's kind of my, at, at a high level, how I would paint the data science industry and how transferring from, you know, physics into, into industry kind of flows. Um, I think probably the most useful thing would be to open up for questions. Usually people have specific questions about making transitions and things like that. So I'm happy to answer uh, any questions along. That, that line. That is great. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, and as we uh, at first uh, explained this session, we really hope it to be an interactive session and really hope uh, to invite everybody to uh, connect with us. Um, just one uh, word of reminder, you can find us uh, through GDS at APS.org. Uh, and we are on LinkedIn, Twitter and all that. You can just uh, search for APS data science and you will be able to find us. Um, but then from now, um, we really want to open this up um, to discussions. I'm uh, wondering the uh, for the Tumo Fest host, uh, are we uh, allowing all of the participants to turn on their video and audio for questions and discussions? Sure. Oh, yeah, gee, please. weren't you also going to say a word about industry? Oh no, no, sorry. Oh. I, I guess Jennifer already did as well. But I think know. so. Yes. Um, and and um, William, to your question, uh, I I really uh, love how Jennifer frames it in um, you know transitioning to industry and taking on data science careers from a physics pers uh, from a physics background. I too uh, graduated with a phys physics PhD, and in my time, it wasn't called data science, but I did do a lot of image analytics, and uh, you know, um, I, I was. Uh, I was using MATLAB and I was using Python and C++ back then. <laughs> you know, it, I echo what Jennifer said. It is about how uh, we frame a problem and how we gather the data and uh, you know use the data to tell a story. I think um, from that perspective, I was trained quite well as a physicist, and I uh, kind of take that forward. Um, 
I definitely took that into my current role in, in the pharmaceutical area. Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of preparing yourself uh, beyond what uh, the, the training background is, I would like to think that physicists have a very, very sound, um, you know, education in terms of how we frame problems, how we think about them, how, how we look at the data, um, and that will carry you a long way. That will be, I think, a pretty distinctive feature of physicists, uh, it, it, you know, in in the whole um, in the whole candidate pool of uh, people with all background trying to get into data science. So I do think, you know, a word of uh, recommendation for graduating. Um, students who want to look into data science, I think physicists uh, has a distinct advantage in a very, in a very unique way um, that I think physicists can use data science and look at data science from a you know, kind of very unique perspective. And uh, I encourage you to kind of use that and um, leverage that in your job search in, in how you think about your future career. And um, so, yeah, so with that, um, again, uh, are we opening up um, video and audio uh, for all of the audience to ask questions? Yep, if you'd like to ask a question, you can go ahead and turn your video and audio on. Um, and we just ask that you pause awesome. for a second, make sure there's one at a time. Hi. Um, so the question that I have been thinking of, uh, you mentioned the um, going it, as far as if you learn one language, then another one, or like new tools come up constantly. There's constantly new things to learn, and especially data science, machine learning, AI, you've got all of that overlap. Um, but then you also said when someone says they want to go into data science, what do you mean when you want to go into data science? So. What I'm wondering is, um, I mean, from your perspective as a someone who does hiring, what um, like do you want to see specialization? As far as like, do you want somebody that primarily does data science, or do you want somebody that is comfortable with going more in the analyst type roles, but then can also help with machine learning projects? Like, do you want the flexibility more, or do you want the specialization more? Particularly at at an in intro, you know, at a, a junior level, um, mm -hmm. I think it's really the capacity to learn, um, which kind of trumps everything. And if you know, it, it also depends on what role you're applying for. So, um, different different companies will advertise a data science role, and they can be completely different. So, so part of my answer there will be, um, you know, what is what is that role? So, like particularly at a startup, you need people who are a little bit more generalist, at least initially. Um, a larger company might have very, you know, kind of specified, tightly constrained roles. So part of it is, is your finding the roles that you want to apply for, um, but really it's the aptitude to learn. Obviously, the, the farther and farther you go um, in your career, the, there is more focus. Um, a lot of people will just talk about it as being um, a T-shaped skill set. You want to see generalization kind of across everything, and then the one area that I know um, really strongly. Uh, and I think that it, but particularly for, um, for, for people kind of coming out, you know, right out of the university, it's really seeing, um, the ability to, to learn however that might manifest itself. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I mean, I'm um, sorry. Sorry. Um, yeah. Th thank you, Jennifer. I just wanted to add that usually I do, um, uh, you know, in, in my mentoring, uh, of, students, I do uh, work with students to identify what he or she wants first to kind of recommend the, the business areas or the industry that they might want to uh, look into uh, in terms of what kind of role uh, would I be interested in. Uh, I come from pharmaceutical, sci uh, ph pharmaceutical industry, which is more 
a more of a traditional industry um, that will treat data science uh, as a tool to address a particular problem within pharmaceuticals, right? Uh, so in that sense, we, uh, I would, um, you know, I, I would be more interested in individuals who kind of understand the business as well as be able to apply the machine learning or AI techniques um, ra rather than having somebody just uh, who, who are just techie and care couldn't care less about the business. Right. Uh, that was actually kind of what I was going to ask uh, next, just as far as the whether it, having the tech background more so than the um, physics first or pharmaceutical or anything like that uh, um, but you prefer someone that understands the industry that you're working in over um, someone who has better understanding of the technical side as a general rule I mean it I'm, I'm only uh, perhaps only speaking from one corner of the whole industry landscape, but in, in, in my uh, in my case, from a more traditional industry perspective, uh, you know, um, as a junior person startup, the ability to learn both the techniques and also the broader business is going to um, set uh, this person up for success. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just add, like, if we think of, again, the spectrum from, like, let's say data engineer all over, you know, over here, data engineer, machine learning engineer, applied research, data science, analyst, um, it's not quite a linear spectrum like that or a straight line like that, but let's say that's kind of generally how, how it might flow. The more you move towards analysts, the more business understanding, the more soft skills, the more visualization, the more storytelling you're going to need to have. If you're, if you're doing, you know, if you're a data engineer, um, by and large data is data. That's not quite true, but um, there's a lot of similarity where knowing the business use case may be less important. Um, but certainly the yeah. more you're, the more you're, the closer you are to the customer, the more you need to understand the business. Yes. Um, so Jennifer, maybe I'll ask a question. Um, so for those who are um, starting or starting out in their journey, um, do portfolio projects help you? Um, like if people have done things on GitHub or they have things that they can point at as compared to just saying, oh yeah, I, I, I uh, looked at a Kaggle or two or I did something on Coursera. Well, Kaggle is, Kaggle is great, but yes, having something, one of the things, the recommendations we give for, um, you know, for you know, whether you're coming out of undergrad, master's, PhD, is to have have something to point to. For a PhD student, it's your PhD, um, and uh, unless you're coming from like a wildly different you know field, like I'm coming from history and I want to be a data scientist, well, okay, well show me, show me, show me that, that you can also do the do the quantitative skills. But if you're particularly an undergrad or a master's student, having uh, maybe it is a Kaggle competition where you can add a little bit more color to it and say, you know, right, here's where the data came from. Here's how I formulated the problem. Here's what I tried. Here are the results I got. Um, otherwise, just even pick up a data set. There's, you know, thousands now of, of public data sets up there. Pick up something that's interesting to you and just try to do something, you know, answer an interesting question. Pose a problem, tell you how you got the data, tell you clean the data, built the model, and then explain that to somebody. And that will really demonstrate to the people who are looking to hire that you kind of understand all of those facets. So yeah, absolutely. That's something that we recommend to, to everybody. Yeah. Uh, and I'll add that I happen also to be in the, uh, a uh, hiring process for some uh, junior positions. And uh, what I would look for uh, is the ability that this person can um, form a story about their journey, right? Um, if you have a physics PhD, what are you, uh, what aspect of this job post excites you and how would you fit yourself, um, fit, fit your journey into this role or how would you see yourself in this role and beyond this role? So I think more of that storytelling uh, is going to be very important. Uh, I do check GitHub <laughs> uh, profiles and you know some students only have a housing price, uh, little housing price 
nice model on GitHub and that's not going to convince me that this person can do AI, right? It, it, it really depends on how, uh, you know, you frame yourself as a storyteller. How, how do I think that you would uh, uh, take on this role and grow in this role? And this also fits into what you want to do with your life, right? Uh, I think it's kind of a mutual fitting process. I'll ask a question going the other way. If there's nothing coming from the audience, um, for the people who are staying in, in research in physics, um, you know, if they, they did their PhD in, in physics and they want to kind of connect to other, you know, ML researchers to, um, you know, solve, solve, you know, you, use machine learning to, to do kind of the next thing, do some of the things that you're working on. How would you um, recommend them taking those steps? Uh, uh so, so sorry, you're, you're, you're asking how do we draw ML people into, into doing physics? Um, yeah, or, or a physicist who's oh. now, you know, I, I, did, I, did, I did traditional physics as my PhD and now I'm kind of, I want to incorporate this into my research. Is it just dive, dive right in or do you recommend them reaching out to people? Or? Oh, oh, oh. I'd say, okay, so one is, I, I guess it depends on a few factors. One is what are your time scales, right? So if it's something like I have a project, I need to get this done now then um, if, it's, if it's something that is hard, then you might decide that it's good to find a friend. And so for example, one of the projects that I'm working on, um, I'm collaborating with a group of computer scientists um, in the GEV where you know, like they're, they're having fun now that I've formulated the problem in a language that computer scientists are happy with, then they can go to town using um, modern methods of um, machine learning, in this case, in their case, um, Monte Carlo um, tree search, right? Um, whereas there are other ones where maybe I, I just wanna learn this, there's not really much competition and it's a kind of a fun thing to do. So with something like say the work on reinforcement learning, I've been doing that myself with, you know, students and such. And there, um, you know, I, I do have dropped in. So for example, where we met uh, was actually at an online AI conference that was really cool. And I, I got to meet um, somebody who is, you know, like an, an expert in RL and pour out my problems and learn that they're not just my problems and, you know, get some advice from people who are actually active in the field. So I, I, I mean, I think that, you know, part of it also just depends on your own motivation you know, like, is it something where you want to learn a bit about RL yourself, or is it something where you have an immediate project where you need an answer yesterday? And so, you know, it's, it's better to call in a professional. We do have one question that came in through the chat. Um, I don't know if everyone got a chance to see it from Nicholas Teague. Um, he's asking, you guys talked about applying machine learning to tackle problems in physics. Can you think of any cases where the domain of physics has benefited research in machine learning, like information theory? And I think William gave a couple answers in the chat, but maybe if anybody else has a, a different perspective. I know for myself- And I, I just typed another one in that I couldn't Oh, sorry. I, I, I just typed in one more that I didn't explain very well in the chat. Um, but there's also the, you know, there's this idea of manifold learning where um, in the dynamical space, there's been some recent work, um, well, maybe not so recent, but there's been some work by Jim Setna on that. Um, he, he talks about this idea of sloppiness. And I, I think that this actually has um, some legs to it. You know, like, can you actually find a, you know, like a lower dimensional representation that's relevant in the, in the space of dynamical systems um, where you're actually just looking at the data, not um, necessarily from a system of equations. So I, I, I think that that could be interesting. Um, so sorry to interrupt you, Jennifer. No, 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 I was gonna say the other, I don't know if, if, if in this case it's not, it's, it's maybe a, a step more indirect than that. Um, but going back to where I started, which was in, in high energy um, physics, I remember, um, you know, when, uh, you know, it, first, you know, using, um, using something like a, a CNN to do pattern recognition for all of these events that, you know, allows you to extract the, the, the physics better from, you know, the various detectors. But uh, I remember when I first heard about, um, graph neural networks and graph convolution networks. And I, you know, the first thing that came through my mind was somebody should put a graph neural net 
like directly on the detector instead of on the instead of on the output that it, it did. And then, you know, a couple, you know, shortly thereafter the physicists did that. And I think, you know, that'll kind of, you know, it, it will, these methods to do um, the extraction, the pattern recognition better will benefit the physics kind of down the road. So that's always a, a maybe for my personal background, the, the field that I always kind of keep tabs on as well. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's still going in the, the ML benefiting physics direction. I mean, like, because I, I mean, I've seen also recent talks, you know, where people have looked at um, accelerating um, simulations for uh, detect for detectors in high energy um, mm -hmm. through through the use of ML, for example. Um, but it looks like we have another fun question from YouTube about how do I separate useful research from hype in ML? Oh, my. Um, <laughs> so. Jennifer, do you want to take the first stab? Oh, um, gosh, how do you separate from hype? Um, I, um, I think uh, if if I may chime in from again a uh, pharmaceutical perspective, uh, one thing that um, you know in clinical trials, uh, in the traditional clinical trial concept, people do very very well is to define the context of use of the algorithms. So um, I think in this case, how do we separate the hype we have? Uh, fr from from what is useful, um, I think people have put in a um, very very carefully uh, art articulated thought about how do we um, treat AI and ML techniques uh, in things like medical devices. Uh, how do we frame that context of use and in what circumstance is this uh, is the technologies going to be uh, valid and uh, uh, is going to be widely accepted by the medical and digital health community in in that sense uh, in that frame framework I think um, the very careful definition of context of use is very, very helpful. And I think to generalize that concept back to, you know, anything that we do with AI and ML for it to be useful, you'd have to really carefully define what the scientific question is. I'll make an inflammatory remark, which is that like, if you hear it in, if you're watching like a, like a news program or something like that, and somebody refers to it as an AI did this, chances are it's, way over I, people in the field don't don't re usually refer to their model as oh i built an i built an ai that did that did something um i feel like uh you know in the in, in, in truth you know you can even sometimes hear the hype around things like that um you know when when you're reading you know you hear it come, come across the news or you read it on a on a blog like that you know the those i think are maybe more easy easier to spot than than let's say even hype within the field i think where um, where sometimes it gets tricky is um, as scientists, we try to, you know, there are methods that gain, um, gain popularity. I mean, right now everything is, you know, is very deep learning focused, um, but even within deep learning, there are certain techniques that are kind of um, cooler than others. And I think the hard thing there is, you know, which of these are going to, which of these are going to last, which of these work well. And that's, that's a much harder, you know, kind of uh, assessing kind of the long-term play or maybe not becoming stuck in a certain approaches is a much more difficult challenge. But I think that's kind of a challenge that exists across a lot of different yeah. fields as well. And I think we're running up on time. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm popping in here. Hi. Um, Jay, I want to give you a chance to, to wrap up if you like. Yeah, th thank you so much, Mia. I do realize that we are now six minutes over time, but uh, really appreciate the, the excitement and the energy on, in this session. And uh, I do hope that everyone enjoyed the session. And also I hope that uh, you can stay connected with APS GDS from, uh, from here on. So uh, with that, I will turn back to uh, Mia. Thanks so much, Jay. Thank you for hosting. And a big thank you to our panelists, William, Trevor, and Jennifer. Um, and thank you everyone for attending and your questions. The video will be available on our YouTube channel and the session page. So feel free to reference that whenever you like. Um, another note I wanted to make is that Jennifer has another session coming up on Monday centered on machine learning for sustainable agriculture. So if you'd like to hear more from her, definitely check that out. That'll be at 1030 AM on Monday, the 26th. Um, that's all for now. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you, Great. everyone. See you. Thanks. Bye. See Thank you. you.